Quote, from the coddling of the American mind, Lukianoff and Haight. There is a principle in philosophy and rhetoric called the principle of charity, which says that one should interpret other people's statements in their best, most reasonable form, not in the worst or most offensive way possible. Introduction Let's start with a compromise. I won't blame you for watching superhero movies if you don't blame me for not watching them. Superhero Saturation In current times, movie after movie is either a superhero or franchise film. It's all Marvel, DC, Star Wars, Harry Potter, or a film where the plot points are focused around being fast and or furious. I am probably one of the few people on the planet who has not partaken in the Marvel Universe. Every film just seems like a man in tights trying to stop a daddy-like villain in a colorful costume. It got even more insulting to this true lover of story when studios took the same plots they used in the 2000s and just recycled them in the 2010s, but now made it with a female superhero or changed the race of the heroes from white to non-white and then pretended they offered us something new. It's all the same story. I'm not alone in my frustration. One of the best directors of all time, Martin Scorsese, who certainly made one of the best films from the 90s, just about lit the world on fire when he said in a New York Times op-ed, Cinema is an art form that brings you the unexpected. In superhero movies, nothing is at risk. I'm always glad to side with the director of Goodfellas on any film topic. I will freely admit I loved Tim Burton's Batman when it came out in 1989. I even enjoyed Spider-Man in 2002 starring Tobey Maguire. But I sure didn't mind that in the 13 years between those two summer blockbusters, besides three Batman sequels in 92, 95, and 97, there were no superhero franchise born in the 90s. The Rocketeer, Blade, The Shadow, and The Phantom were all released, but they didn't make big splashes, and the studios didn't junk smaller pictures for costume capers. For every Batman sequel, there were a slew of other movies like Sister Act, Shakespeare in Love, Crimson Tide, Misery, or The Ref. I discovered it truly annoys others that I will not watch superhero movies. I don't really care if the spaceman saves the city with their magic powers. I'm just not that interested if the one spaceship shoots the other spaceship. I find nothing to bond with when zombies cause the end of the world. I don't mind that the majority of the world seems to love them. I just wish there was still room for a variety of stories from a spectrum of writers and directors that covered all forms of art just like there was in the 90s, and that the studios gave them the money to make them for the big screen. Give me the stories shepherded by Mike Nichols, Quentin Tarantino, Paul Thomas Anderson, Spike Lee, Rob Reiner, Barbara Streisand, and Nora Ephraim. Before you tell me there are still films made that are not about superheroes, let me clarify that the films labeled as dramas today are so dour and depressing that I need to take a shot of tequila and chase it down with Prozac in order to go back to work the next day. As I will point out when this book gets into covering specific films, movies used to be funny and sad. They were not just meditations on one emotion. There are true belly laughs in The Shawshank Redemption. And there are serious moments in Mermaids. As a society, we were perfectly fine with holding two thoughts in our mind at once. Sometimes even three or four at a time. Scary, I know. I've always been drawn to a movie that creates a world and a story that I haven't seen before. I want the writer and the director to take a risk. Be brave. Dare to offend someone with their thoughts. But even that isn't correct because no one considered telling a complex story a risk back then. It was art. Films were made to make you think, make you feel, and sometimes make you upset. I will discuss one of the best examples of this in the 1992 chapter when I cover the king of pushing an audience's buttons, Spike Lee, and his masterpiece, Malcolm X. Not only are studios currently avoiding risk, 
They're now recycling the exact same stories. We live in a time where movie studios make an animated film, then take it to Broadway, add some new songs, then remake the same story as a live action version with no songs, then refilm the same damn story, but this time with new songs, then top it off with another animated version. And somehow each version is a success. How many times can one person watch a monkey hold up a lion cub? I realize the success is because audiences have adapted to the comfort of knowing the story before they see it. But there was a time when that same audience demanded to have new stories that were full of uncertainties. The time was the 90s. The Awakening The genesis for this book came from a movie that was forgotten to me. One night while looking for a movie, any movie, to stream, I scrolled upon the Penny Marshall-directed film Awakenings, starring Robin Williams and Robert De Niro. I hadn't seen this film in 30 years. I knew I had seen it when it first came out, but it wasn't one I ever owned. We used to own copies of our favorite films on VHS or DVD and could watch them whenever we wanted without paying 10 bucks a month for life. It's a crazy multiverse that my timeline originates from. What initially shocked me about this film was that Robert De Niro doesn't show up on screen for 20 minutes. Can you imagine a movie being made today where one of the two stars isn't in 16% of the movie? Not to mention a superstar like Robert De Niro. This is not a cameo role. He is one of the two major characters in the film. In fact, the first act isn't even about Encelitis Lethargica, which is the disease De Niro's character awakens from. They spent the beginning of this movie, wait for it, developing the Robin Williams character. This is a characteristic I soon discovered many of the films from the 90s shared. In Scent of a Woman, the story of Al Pacino's last hurrah in New York City doesn't start for 30 minutes into the picture, and Kevin Costner doesn't arrive at his military camp until 26 minutes into Dances with Wolves. They earned your buy-in to the characters before their journeys started. The filmmakers didn't expect you to already care about the characters because you already read the comic book. This also happened in movies based on comic books. Batman Returns uses more than the first 30 minutes to develop the backstory of Catwoman and the Penguin. Michael Keaton doesn't say more than two words until 37 minutes into the film. To flip things around from Awakenings, Robin Williams doesn't show up in Goodwill Hunting until 33 minutes into the picture. In the 90s, movies were expected to develop characters and make you feel for the person. That is what made the ending so satisfying or heartbreaking, because the filmmakers showed us who the characters were. They didn't just tell us. Awakenings is another example of a movie that has a lot of humor in it. Yes, it is a heartbreaking topic of patients who lost so much of their life to a disease, but the writer, Steve Zalian, didn't beat us over the head with sadness. We experience joy as De Niro and the other patients remember what it was like to live life, and then we are saddened when they start to lose that ability. The script isn't just pure misery, which is exactly what dramatic films of current times seem to strive for. I know, you want me to give examples from movies made after the 90s. Here's the thing, though. I have a rule about not being mean to art or artists. I like to lift things up, not tear them down. Plus, you know the movies I'm talking about. Just look at practically any drama made in the last 10 years, and you will find the rumination on one emotion films that I'm talking about. Movies in the 90s respected its audience, developed characters, took its time to get going, while balancing that with respect for the viewer's time. The icing on the cake was the fact that Awakenings came out in 1990. That got me thinking, and we all know how dangerous a thing that can be. Video time. I wondered what else I would learn if I started watching other films from the 90s. Over the past decade, I watched maybe one current movie a year. Television was where it was at for me, although lately television is falling into the franchise superhero trap. I smell a sequel to this book. 
But when I looked at all the DVDs and Blu-rays shoved into boxes in my closet, I remembered how much I used to actually love movies. I read movie magazines, I collected posters, I saw films on opening day. One of the main reasons for this love came from the fact that when I was in college, I worked at Video Time, a rental store that rented VHS tapes. What year did I start working there? You guessed it, 1990. Hmm, a pattern appears to be forming. Video rental stores were the greatest thing to happen to college kids since the invention of the bong. We must digress here to truly remember how spectacular video stores were. The store I worked at had a very simple pricing plan. Older movies were 99 cents, and new releases and porn were $1.99. Strange side note. The owners of the store allowed us to take older movies and porn home for free, but we had to pay for new releases. My theory about this policy? They wanted us to be knowledgeable in the classics and to have the ability to have sex with multiple species. I took full advantage of this perk. Wait a minute! The classics, not the porn. I worked at Video Time for three years, and in that time, I watched every new release, never paid for a one of them, and a ton of classics. That is when I first saw The Godfather, Funny Girl, Casablanca, Taxi Driver, Chinatown, American Graffiti, Citizen Kane, and Eraserhead. I mixed them in with Do the Right Thing, Dangerous Liaisons, Reservoir Dogs, Bob Roberts, Slacker, and what has somehow become the center of my freaking universe, Awakenings. When you work at a video store, you have this overriding belief that you have to watch every film released. I probably did see just about every movie released in the early 90s and late 80s. I watched them while I was at work, Then I would take a couple of them home to watch after work. I brought a few of them with me to parties. Working at the video store was like owning the keys to the world's entertainment. I love thinking about this era for writers and film aficionados like myself. Every movie was available to everyone in my small town of Maslin, Ohio. All anyone needed was 99 cents and their mind could be open to all cinema. If video stores were invented today, customers would have to pay a monthly fee and then a surcharge on top of that to rent each flick. Each store would not be specifically owned by a mom-and-pop owner like Video Time was, but by corporate-run studios. Renters would only be able to get Paramount movies from a Paramount video store. Want to rent that latest HBO movie? You gotta go to an HBO rental store. Want to see the fifth version of The Lion King? You can't rent that from Video Time. You gotta go to Video Disney Time. Today, streaming is more split apart than a divorced family tree. Back catalogs are only available to those who can pay month after monthly fees and to every different studio. In the early 90s, the heydays of the VHS tape, Video Time had all the movies in one spot. Get your Star Trek or your Star Wars side by side in the science fiction section. Find your dramas from Miramax, animated movies from Disney, and slightly riskier Disney movies from Touchstone Pictures, along with comedies from Universal and horror films from New Line Cinema. Everyone was welcome. Damn. We didn't have a clue how lucky we were. I've written several books about television and film, hosted podcasts and celebrity panels after film screenings, even wrote and directed small films and documentaries. But it was my three years at a video store that I feel gives me the qualifications to write this book. I would never compare myself to the master of 90s films, Mr. Quentin Tarantino. But like him, I got my film education at a video store, and I've used that education a hell of a lot more than I ever used my marketing degree from the University of Akron. Something for everyone. A quick trip to IMDb showed me there were 36,931 films released between January 1st, 1990 and December 31st, 1999. Well, I figured I should be able to watch all those in a week. No problem. One week later. Okay, new plan. Time to pare this list down. I wanted to take a look at other films I might have forgotten or hadn't seen in a while. 
the list came out to be a little over 160 films. That would mean I would watch 0.004% of all films made that decade. I was very glad no one knew how to do math anymore, so they couldn't bust me out for making my sweeping claim about the entire film industry based on such a small sample. But let's not forget my video store experience, that at least rounds me up to a solid 0%. I figured I would start by picking 10 to 15 pictures a year. I wasn't trying to watch the most obscure art films from the decade, but movies that were made for everyone, played everywhere, and made some impact, small or large, on film culture. For some reason, and I feel this somehow makes my claim even more valid, 1995 had the most films that seemed worthy of my time with 26 films. My spreadsheet can be found in the back of the book. I decided right away to jettison horror, sorry scream, documentaries, sorry hoop dreams, foreign, sorry la femme Nikita, and animation, sorry Aladdin. Those genres didn't need tending to, as they are still alive and well, and were always marketed to their respective audiences. Kids' movies aren't specifically made for adults. Documentaries are fact-based, and horror movies are really its own genre for adults and teenagers. Plus, I never watched a horror movie since Freddy Krueger scared me to death in the movie theater, but I did hold hands with Mindy Morrow, so it was worth it. I also felt there wasn't as much of a need for me to cover art house films like My Own Private Idaho, Spanking the Monkey, or any David Lynch film, because those types of movies will always be made for small budgets and find devoted small audiences. My overall plan was to focus on movies that were geared towards mass-marketed adult audiences and made a small to moderate pop culture impact. I had a few people argue with me on if there really was such a thing as movies made for adults. How would that even be defined? Then I read in Quentin Tarantino's Cinema Speculation book, where he described the renaissance of films in the late 60s and early 70s out of the boredom of films from the 50s as adult-oriented Hollywood. If it was a good enough term for Tarantino in his book, it was a good enough term for me in mine. It was adult-oriented films I missed, the kind of studio films that were replaced with franchise movies. The more I watched 90s films, the more I felt that everything I enjoyed about movies had disappeared, and the more I began to think that the 90s was the last decade of cinema for adults who wanted to think, feel, and be positively impacted by stories told through light and sound. While I am certain many will argue with this assertion, I don't think anyone will argue it was the last decade where small pictures had a fighting chance of making money and being seen in multiplexes across the country. It truly was the last decade where any genre of movie had a shot at success. I specifically remember seeing small pictures like Beautiful Girls, Boxing Helena, and Chasing Amy at my local cinemas, and I lived in Ohio, not New York or California. The movie theaters around me played small films as well as blockbusters. I am never trying to claim there were no action or franchise films in the 90s. It just wasn't the only meal served on our plate. You had your blockbuster action pictures, Twisters, Armageddon, The Matrix, but you also had full-fledged dramas filling movie theaters, Glengarry Glen Ross, Bridges of Madison County, How to Make an American Quilt, as well as independent small films, The Crying Game, Two Girls and a Guy, To Die For. There was also a healthy dose of black cinema with Friday, Boys in the Hood, Devil in a Blue Dress, along with the beginning of queer movies crossing over to the mainstream with Jeffrey, The Birdcage, and My Own Private Idaho. Anyone and everyone was welcome to make a movie. A director could be technically gifted as Spielberg, Saving Private Ryan, or Martin Scorsese, Casino, or could be known as being a verbal director like Ed Burns, Brothers McMullen, or Kevin Smith, Clerks. There is no doubt there is a lack of female directors in this decade, but we did have Amy Heckerling, Clueless, Penny Marshall, A League of Their Own, Jodie Foster, Home for the Holidays, and Jane Campion, The Piano, helming classic films of the time. 
Romantic comedies were a huge staple as Meg Ryan, Sleepless in Seattle, and Julia Roberts, Something to Talk About, carried picture after picture. Teenagers were not supposed to go see Six Degrees of Separation or The Straight Story. They could watch Billy Madison or Ten Things I Hate About You. But guess what? Grown-ups could also get something out of a film like Pump Up the Volume because no matter who the film was intended for, it was expected to be well-made and entertaining. Let's also not forget about sex. Oh, how we loved our mainstream erotic movies back before porn was everywhere on the internet. Michael Douglas would be living in a smaller mansion today if it weren't for movies like Basic Instinct or Disclosure. And how else could we have seen all of Madonna if it weren't for her skin flick body of evidence? I guess we would have had to buy her erotica book, subscribe to Playboy, or watch MTV. The point is, there were so many different options of movies to watch in the 90s. It was never one size fits all. As my Sondheim quote that started this book points out, it truly was something for everyone. So why did they stop making these films if they were successful and people like me loved them so much? While it would be so much fun to just blame the studios, it might actually be our fault. <gasps> it all goes back to my beloved video store. There was such a healthy home video market that a movie had three chances to make money. First at the box office, second during the video rental market, third when the VHS was re-released at a price where fans could actually purchase the VHS tape. Do you remember that each movie on VHS cost somewhere around a hundred American dollars when they were first released? That is around $220 in today's money. Would you pay that much to own Lyle Lyle Crocodile? Later on, the studios would start selling them at sell-through prices of $20, but in the beginning, owning a movie cost a pretty penny. Matt Damon explained how the rental market truly helped the smaller adult-type movies make their money back when he guested on the program First We Feast. He said, The DVD was a huge part of our revenue stream, and technology has made that obsolete. The movies we used to make... You could afford to not make all of your money when it played in the theater because you knew you had the DVD coming behind the release and six months later would get a whole other chunk. It would be like reopening the movie almost. When that went away, it changed the kind of movies we could make. Technology and our reluctance to leave our homes forced studios to only make the kinds of movies guaranteed to recoup their investment at the box office. Once the masses decided they didn't want to own movies anymore, they would just stream them, studios had to make movies that could make back all their money in the theater. To do this, it had to appeal to the widest audience possible. There goes Sling Blade. It had to offend no one. There goes Citizen Ruth. It had to appeal to ticket buyers with a ton of discretionary funds. There goes Little Man Tate. It had to play as many times as possible in the day. There goes Meet Joe Black. It had to play well outside of the United States. There goes Fargo. You can see how the loss of the home video market had a huge impact on what films were being made. Storytelling v. Technology as I began to make my way through the list of films I had and had never seen before, I quickly discovered these movies were complex, adult, filled with character development, strive to be artistic, and were backed up with modern technology when it came to editing, scoring, lighting, and cameras. It is this balance of storytelling and technology that is my actual claim. I am well aware, no matter how many times I proclaim it in this book, reviewers and online foes are going to claim that I said the 90s were the only decade of good cinema. I'm not saying that. My claim will never be that movies weren't good in the 70s or 80s, or that no good movies have been released in the new century. What I discovered is none of the movies I rewatched from the 90s felt as old as movies from prior decades. My contention is that if you made a graph and you put storytelling on one side and technology on the other, storytelling would start high and continue downward. Technology would start low and head upward. The intersection of that very non-scientific graph would be in the 90s. 
Of course, movies in the 70s are known for being complex and the American movie industry's coming out party for character based realism cinema. But man, some of the scores of those movies are really tough. They have a heavy handed or over dramatic bump, 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 bump feel to them. The films, while complex, have a pace that feels old and outdated. They just weren't technologically as advanced as films were in the 90s. I can already hear you saying technology and special effects got much better after the 90s, so movies now must be even better. Not so. The quality of storytelling slipped away as special effects took precedence over character development. Now, I know you are just dying to argue with my theory. Let me be on your side for a moment. When I'm asked what my all time favorite movie is, I always answer without a thought broadcast news. When did that film come out? 1987. I believe broadcast news has one of the best scripts ever written and is so quotable. I am singing while I'm reading. I can sing while reading both. But have you watched it recently? It looks old. It feels old. The pacing is just a bit off. The technology of cameras, lighting, editing, scoring, it just isn't quite there in films from the 80s. Holly Hunter is amazing. The acting is modern, but the film just isn't. It doesn't mean there aren't great scripts before 1990 or after 2000. In fact, directors like Quentin Tarantino, Alexander Payne, Paul Thomas Anderson, who made their fame in the 90s, kept making 90s-esque movies throughout their career. But new directors that came of age after are just not as brave or skilled in telling human stories. And let's not forget my entire idea is a generalization. Decades are human-made. What is the best romantic comedy of all time? Easy, When Harry Met Sally. That came out in 1989. My second favorite film is Wonder Boys, and that came out in 2000. Both of those films would have nicely fit in this book, but I wanted to go with the neat and tidy use of a decade. What really is a decade but a made-up line that we drew in the endless sands of time? I promise I wasn't high when I wrote that sentence. Of course, there are great movies before and after, but I'm speaking in generalities, and I generally do believe the combination of the skill of the artist mixed with the respect for the viewers and, above all things, the heavy dose of adult themes collide together so perfectly in the decade when I was in my 20s. No doubt special effects came of age in the 90s. They were set free in Terminator 2 in Jurassic Park and then filled the entire screen in 1999 Star Wars The Phantom Menace. The genesis for modern special effects was truly born in 1989's The Abyss and it took a decade for it to drown the rest of the movies. When that dreadful Star Wars movie came out, studios went all in. Why hire all those background extras in Evita outside Ava Perón's balcony as she belts out Don't Cry For Me Argentina? They could just be computer generated, like the audience watching little Darth Vader win a go-kart race. Once I saw that I could begin this book with Goodfellas in 1990 and point out that the decade ends with Phantom Menace in 1999, I was pretty darn secure in my theory that cinema ends with the invention of Jar Jar Binks. Can we please tell Joe Pesci's Tommy character that Jar Jar Binks thinks he's funny and send him after Jar Jar? No one knew that fear would soon take over all artistic and corporate decisions. It is a look at the last time where we just went to the movies to be entertained, to dream, to feel, to cry, to laugh, to escape, and to reflect. And if you were a wannabe writer from Ohio, to learn how to create from artists who had experiences different from their own. Well, enough of these previews. Let's just watch the film.